Good afternoon. I'm Phoebe Connolly, Deputy Director of Video at the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. I'd like to start by thanking the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the other generous sponsors who have made this event possible. It is my great pleasure today to introduce John Scalzi. If you are a reader of his blog, you'll know that John recently unlocked the life achievement of acquiring a drinks fridge, which as a Midwesterner left me speechless with envy and admiration. But you're here because Scalzi is the New York Times bestselling author of Old Man's War, Red Shirts, and Head On, and is the recipient of the Hugo, the Locus, the Audi, and the 2016 Governor's Award for the Arts in Ohio. His most recent book is The Consuming Fire, book two of the Interdependency series. The Los Angeles Times wrote of his latest, the world building is breathtaking, it's almost impossible not to get drawn into the system of the far future. Please join me in welcoming John Scalzi to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Uh, before I begin, I just couldn't notice that somebody that I know is actually in the audience, my friend Joe, uh, who I worked with at America Online when I lived in, uh, in this area uh, about 20 years ago. And the thing to know about Joe is that I actually killed him not once but twice in my books. <laughs> the first time, it was because he was my editor and I had said something to him and he was snarking. I was like, that's it, I'm gonna murder you in a book. And then the second book was uh, happening at the same time uh, as that first book, so I had to kill him again. And I think it was the, his reaction was like, the first time it was funny, now I'm concerned. <laughs> so Joe, I apologize for murdering you twice. Uh, please don't kill me now. Uh, thank you all for coming to my thing. I, I, I did a thing that I don't usually do, which is I actually planned a talk that is not me just reading from uh, an upcoming work or something like that. I'm actually going to tell you about the book that uh, I'm supposed to be talking to you about. Um, so I'm going to talk about that for a little bit, and if we have time left over, um, then I'm actually going to try to uh, read you a very short, short story that I wrote about technology and how it's going to kill us all. Um, so I, I know you'll be here for that. Um, and then we'll do question and answers. Like they said, uh, the question and answer, I usually uh, have the rules of questions must be in the form of a question. Um, the question has to be a one-part question. Um, and try to make the questions themselves like tweet length. That's the 280 characters. And the reason we do that is that so we can have as many people ask questions as possible. Um, not because I'm a tyrant who just wants things my way. Um, so as long as we're okay with that, then I, I think we'll have a good time in these next 45 minutes. And the thing is, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the book, uh, The Consuming Fire. Actually, I'm going to talk about the series, which is the interdependency series, um, which includes The Collapsing Empire, which is the first book, The Consuming Fire, which is the second book, which is out now, and is the most recent book that I have uh, that has come out. Um, and then the third book, which I am writing even as we speak, not literally right this second because I'm talking to you, but as far as my editor knows, <laughs> I am writing it when I go back to my uh, hotel room, which is called The Last Emperor. Um, and the thing about the Interdependency series, which is kind of funny, is uh, I started thinking about this book in two or these books into about 2014, and the idea behind them is there's a galaxy-spanning uh, sort of faster-than-light highway or river, which is called the flow. Um, that's how people get from one place to, to the next. And in the course of the books, the flow starts collapsing. And so that's the base, and, and how people are responding to that is what drives the, drives the books. But what's been interesting to me is watching people respond to the books, specifically um, in many ways, starting with the titles. You know, for the first book is called The Collapsing Empire, uh, in which people were like, oh, so we're writing about America now are we you know uh, or the consuming fire which is another one where they're like that's a little on the nose uh, and then people are like reading the books and they're like well these are clearly books that are about climate change denial or oh, like no no actually they're books about brexit no they're actually books about bad governance and you know and so the you know listening to people talk about how they are seeing the events of today um, 
being uh, played out in the books that I'm writing, that um, they really believe that I am writing these books about uh, or commenting on the contemporary world. I'm just setting it in the future. And the irony of this for me um, is that for these books, it really was not, the precipitating idea was not about climate change or Brexit or bad governance. I was, because I am a nerd, thinking about the golden age of, of European colonization from the 15th to 19th centuries. <laughs> Particularly what I was thinking about it was the colonization and exploitation of the Americas, notably by England, Spain, and Portugal. And the way that that happened was that through the technology of the time, and the technology of the time were these wind-driven ships. Now in in the Atlantic Ocean, there are um, the trade winds and the ocean currents, and they basically form this great gyre, or gyre, whatever, however it's pronounced. Um, and the ships go one way, and then they come back another way, and they come back around. And that's how uh, a lot of uh, the American exploitation and colonialization happened, because those trade winds were there, and the technology took advantage of that. Um, the Europeans benefited enormously from these natural phenomenon that they had absolutely no control over. And so what I thought about was what would have happened if these trade winds and the ocean currents just stopped? They just stopped, which kind of seems like a fantastical idea, but it's really not. I mean, it's not impossible to disrupt the, uh, the cycle of ocean currents, for example. Uh, like, for example, if you heat up the planet and you melt a whole lot of the glaciers in Greenland, then all that cold water goes into the ocean, sinks to the bottom where the engine of these uh, currents happens, disrupts them entirely. All of a sudden, uh, Europe is a popsicle and they're all screwed. Could happen. Uh, don't know how. But the whole point of that was for me is that the course of history would have been changed, and it would have been changed because uh, the technology of the time relied on, assumed, a, uh, a natural feature of the Earth was eternal, which it may not have been and may still not be. And so I took that idea, and because I was not writing historical fiction, because people will check your facts, <laughs> I moved it to the future where nobody can tell if I've got it screwed up because by the time it happens, it'll be dead. Um, so that was the precipitating idea, and I wrote it in 2014, long before anything that's happening now was happening. Um, so. For me, when people are like, it's Brexit, it's climate change denial, I'm like, no, it's about colonialism. <laughs> the other thing is that I also have a general philosophy of not bringing up specific political issues from today uh, in, the current, in, in the science fiction that I write in the very, very far future. Um, the way that I explain this to people is that like taking something that's going on today in a very non-allegorical sense and just bringing it 500 years in the future or 400 years or something like that would be like somebody writing contemporary fiction today uh, in a world where everyone, including everybody in this room, is passionately, madly, and has immediately accessible opinions about the alien and sedition acts, right? I mean, this is Washington, D.C. You may actually have opinions about the Alien and Sedition Acts, and actually let me have a show of hands. How many of you are Jeffersonians in this particular case? <laughs> and how many of you are Adamses? You Adamses can leave the room now. Because <laughs> he was wrong. But this is my whole point. This is my whole point. It's like, it's not, most of you know if you had history class what the Alien and Sedition Acts are, but you otherwise don't really particularly care. Um, and most of the people 400 years from the future are con current uh, contrasts everything that we're going through. They'll be like, well, that was a thing that happened. Do I have to know it for the test? And that's, and that's how they're going to relate to it. If you're doing stuff like illusion and metaphor and stuff like that, that's fine too. But it's otherwise, but even then, you have to be really careful about, and now I'm on a soapbox because all of a sudden you break the thing where the person is enveloped in your world and they're like, oh, he's talking about Brexit, isn't he? So, so those are things that generally speaking when I'm writing in science fiction, I try to avoid. I don't try to make it just talking about things that are going on now. But for all of that, for all of that science fiction, all about science fiction being in the future, it is written in the current time. 
uh, by people who are living in the current times. Hi, I'm John Scalzi. I was born in 1969. I'm 50 years old. The only times I've ever known are the times that we are in now. Um, and the people who are alive today and who are reading have the same circumstances as I do. Some of you are older, some of you are younger. As I go along, fewer of you will be older. Um, and lots more of you will be younger. I am freaked out about the idea that there are two generations of adults who are older than me and the fact that people who are 10 years younger than me are now middle-aged. Stop doing that. <laughs> but that's just kind of the way it is. Um, so I'm a writer. I live today and I cannot help but be influenced by current events, both positively and negatively. I thought of this idea for this uh, interdependency series in 2014, but I started writing it in 2016. Um, so, and I'm currently writing the third book, as far as my editor knows. So, you know, the, there, the, the period of time in which I am writing these books encompasses basically what I call the current chaos, right? Um, and so it has an effect on me just by existing. Not only that, but my past as a writer is as a newspaper journalist and columnist. I find it really, really hard not to pay attention because this is my fundamental training of what's going on today, what do I think about it, let me tell you. I had my first job as a nationally syndicated columnist when I was 24. I was a professional mansplainer. Right? And it's hard to break, it's hard to break that out. Um, and so it's very difficult for me to filter that all out and not to be thinking about it. Um, so I can't help but be affected by what's going on today. Moreover, you as readers cannot help but be affected by what's going on in the world today. When writers write a book, they know why they're writing the book sometimes and they have an idea of why they write and what they meant and all that sort of stuff. You are not us. You often do not know what we are thinking about our books. Why you come to the book basically with what the words are and your own interpretation of it. The book is only half about the author. The other half is about you as the reader and is what you bring into it. And what are you bringing into the books when you read them? You are bringing your own concerns, fears, apprehensions, and connections. So the fact of the matter is, even if I didn't intend to write about bad governance and Brexit and climate denial, people are still going to be making those connections because it's what they see in the world right now and it's in the air of the times. We are all captive uh, of the world that, that we live in. Some of us are responsible in greater or lesser ways for making those worlds, but a lot of us are just like, we're here, this is what we're dealing with. And as a writer, I cannot tell people that they are wrong for finding the parallels in these books that I did not necessarily intend. I mean, I could say it, it's like all of you are wrong, how dare you, you know, the voice of the author has spoken, um, but by and large, again, the book is not just what I wrote, it's what you bring to it as well. You are going to see parallels there and I am going to be affected by the times. The, the world that we live in makes an effect on the world that I've built. I am currently writing the third book in the series. I am behind because the world is distracting. Don't tell the editor. Uh, and I'm still not intentionally writing about climate denial or Brexit or bad governance, even though I know so many people who have been reading this series are thinking about these things. But the fact of the matter is that uh, the crisis in the universe I created, um, the people who are facing that crisis are reacting in a way that is not going to be dissimilar to the way that humans in the real world are reacting to the crises we are all facing today. We are all still the same human beings 1,500 years in the future as we are today as we were 30,000 years ago when we were uh, in the savannah and the only thing we had to worry about were jaguars and food. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, the, one of the things that, I, that uh, I talk about in the new book is I talk about the five stages of crisis management, which are used by people who have no desire to face up to the looming unavoidable wrenching change that is coming, um, or for those for whom this looming uh, change is inconvenient for their business plan. 
So these five stages of um, the five stages of crisis management are denial, 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 <laughs> denial, and holy crap, everything is screwed. Grab as much cash as you possibly can and run. These five stages, I regret to say, are not exclusive to my universe. <laughs> Nor is greed and cupidity and short-sightedness or the other and the dynamics of the events that occur because of these qualities. People are going to see parallels in what I'm writing in this third book to what is happening now because the humans in my book are based on the humans that exist in the real world and how they respond to the crises around them. But I should also note that in my book, there are people who are fighting against the greed and the cupidity and the stupidity and every, the short-sightedness, and they are doing what they can to save the people who are affected by the change that is coming. That means everybody in that particular universe and to prepare them for whatever comes next. And that too, is because the people in my book are based on people in the real world as well. Now, in my books, I know what's going to happen, and I write the fates of the people in them, and I make their choices for them, and I know whether their endings to the response, to the, you know, the extent that they are in the books are happy or sad or somewhere in between. In the real world, we don't know what's going to happen, and I can't write everyone's fate. And so we all have to decide what sort of people we are going to choose to be, whether we are going to be the short-sighted ones, or if we're going to be another type of person entirely. You are the people who have to choose that. And so I say to you, choose wisely. The next generation of writers is out there. They are literally out here. And even if they write about the future as I do, they're going to be writing in the world that we leave them for the readers who follow us. And now is the time that we have to decide what it is they choose to say. And that's that. Whoa, that was really heavy. Um, so, uh, and to lighten the mood a little bit, and because it's kind of fun to do, I'm going to read you a short story uh, that I wrote uh, uh, for the last tour that I was doing called um, Automated Customer Service. Now, we all know that when you call people uh, for customer service that you don't actually get to talk to a human anymore. They put you into the automated service response, uh, and they keep you in there as long as possible so that you don't talk to a human. Um, in fact, one of the ways that you can shortcut that is to start swearing and sound angry because they have actually figured out how to tell when you're stressed and when to escalate it into an actual live human. There's some irony that the way you can talk to a human is to be like, let me speak to the manager, but that's the way it goes. So I'm imagining a universe where it's about three or four or five years into the future where we've taken that automated response just a little bit further uh, and, uh, and what we're, you are, imagine that you are talking to the automated customer service about a vacuum cleaner, an automated vacuum cleaner that you just bought that's gone a little haywire. Thank you for calling the customer service line of VacuBot, purveyors of America's finest automated vacuum cleaners. In order to more efficiently handle call volume, we rely on automated responses. To continue in English, press one. Para Espanol, o primo dos. Let's continue in English. Which VacuBot product are you calling about? For the AccuBot, VacuBot S10 model, press one. For the VacuBot XL model, press two. For the VacuBot Extreme Clean model, press three. Congratulations on owning the VacuBot Extreme Clean model, America's most thorough and comprehensive automated vacuum cleaning solution. If you need to order additional components for the Extreme Clean, press 1. If you have a repair query, press 2. For all other questions, press 3. You have additional questions. If you need help connecting the VacuBot Extreme Clean to your home network, press 1. If the VacuBot Extreme Clean is conflicting with other automated home machines, press 2. 
if the vacuum extreme has decided to purge your house of all living things, <laughs> press three. Congratulations on activating purge mode. <laughs> While purge mode was designed to eradicate small pests like insects and spiders, in some models a beta software build was inadvertently released that includes larger targets like pets and some humans. We are sorry for the inconvenience. To continue, please press 1. Be aware that by pressing 1, you are absolving VacuBot and its owner, Bieber Holdings, of all legal and medical responsibility. You pressed 0 to speak to a human representative. The current wait time for a human representative is 6 hours and 14 minutes. To return to the automated response system, press 1. Welcome back to the automated response system. First things first, have you tried turning the VacuBot Extreme Clean off and on again? Press 1 for yes, 2 for no. You said no. Is that because the VacuBot Extreme Clean is currently exhibiting taser defense mode, <laughs> making it impossible to approach without having 50,000 volts of electricity course through your body? Press 1 for yes, 2 for no. We apologize for the taser defense mode. It was originally designed to zap small insects, but our subcontractor misread the manufacturer's specifications. Fortunately, the defense mode can be distracted by throwing something at the VacuBot Extreme Clean, like a heavy blanket or a pet. <laughs> if you have a heavy blanket, press 1. If you have a pet, press 2. The automated system has detected that you are using high levels of profanity right now. While the automated system is in fact automated and does not care what you yell at it, your bad attitude is being noted for if and when you are put in contact with a human representative. When you have calmed your sassy boots down a bit, please press one. That's better. Now let's talk about pets. If you have a cat, press 1. If you have a dog, press 2. You have a cat. Excellent. Now all you have to do is toss the cat at the VacuBot Extreme Clean, and while it is busy zapping the cat, you rush in and turn it off. If you are willing to do this, press 1. If you are not, press 2. What do you mean you are not willing to electrocute your cat? It is a cat. It would do the same to you in an instant. Look into its cold, pitiless eyes and tell me it would not. Press 1 for obvious agreement. Press 2 if you have been duped by this feral interloper in your own home. Fine. Then we'll just have to go with the heavy blanket. You do have one of those at least, right? Press 1 for yes, 2 for no. Good, you have basic home decor. Now the plan here is, throw the blanket over the VacuBot Extreme Clean, and while it is struggling, trying to get the blanket off it, you run over and turn it off, making sure not to touch the actual VacuBot, because then it will just zap the crap out of you. Press 1 when you're about to throw the blanket. Did it work? <laughs> 1 for yes, 2 for no. We're sorry to hear that it did not work. Just out of curiosity, did it not work because the VacuBot Extreme Clean vaporized it with previously unannounced lasers? One for yes, two for no. We apologize for the lasers. The VacuBot Extreme Clean is meant to have onboard LiDAR to help navigate the room more intelligently, but we got a really good deal on some surplus military lasers. On the other hand, it's probably a good thing you didn't throw that cat after all. <laughs> See, now you're just shouting a lot of profanity again. Just press one when you're done. Also, stop pressing zero for a human representative. We are not exposing our very fine customer service people to you. Not with that attitude. Just press one. Are you trying to wait us out? We are an automated response service. We have nothing but time. Press one or don't. We can wait forever. 
We thank you for pausing your hissy fit. We regret to inform you that because you have attacked your Vacubotic stream clean with a blanket, it has likely now classified you as an enemy and burned that classification into its permanent memory. It has probably now also targeted your cat. In scenarios such as this, your Vacubotic stream clean will classify any area it's cleaned as its personal territory. Has this Vacubotic stream clean cleaned your entire home? Press one for yes, two for no. Well, it's the VacuBot's house now. <laughs> we suggest you grab the cat and run. Seriously, run. Those lasers have probably recharged by now. Run and don't look back. The VacuBot senses fear. Press one when you have reached minimum safe distance from the VacuBot's lair. Congratulations, you have escaped the unstoppable killing machine that is the VacuBot Extreme Clean. Unfortunately, you cannot stop now. The VacuBot Extreme Clean has forwarded information about you to all the other VacuBots, all of whom will now hunt you ceaselessly until you have been cleaned from the surface of this planet. This is your life now to wander, never a moment's rest, until even your cat deserts you and you are left alone to contemplate the barren wasteland that is now your existence. Unless, of course, you would like to purchase a place on the exclusive VacuBot Termination whitelist. Just $69.95 a month. Press 1 for a special introductory rate. Thank you for your purchase. We'll connect you to a human representative now. Okay, that's it. Okay, so now we have uh, about 18 minutes for questions, and the, the question microphones are right there. Uh, and so if you have a question, and you can ask me about anything. You can ask me about current books. You can ask me about upcoming books. You can ask me about writing. You can ask me about my personal life. You can ask me about my cats. You can ask anything you want, and I promise I will answer the question. Sometimes the answer to the question is, I can't believe you asked that question. You are a horrible person. Leave now and never come back. So as long as we know that these are the questions, uh, the, question, the rules of the question answer time, uh, let's go to the questions. And remember, questions are in the form of? A question. Questions have how many parts? One. And how long are they? Short. <laughs> I love all of you. Uh, so let's start over here. Go ahead and start. Uh, good morning. Will you be writing any more dispatcher novels? Uh, the question is, will I be writing any more dispatcher novels? Dispatcher, dispatcher is a uh, uh, book that I wrote where it uh, takes place in the near future where 999 times out of 1,000, if you murder someone, they come back, they know you did it, and they're very angry with you. Uh, and the answer to that is yes, I will be writing more of those. Um, in fact, I was supposed to have finished one of them uh, before I finished the book that I am currently writing, but it's been an interesting year for my writing. So um, it will get done. It will be probably out next year. Next question right here. Uh, writers or works that have particularly in influenced you generally or this particular or your current series? Um, people who have influenced me in general or for the current series in particular? Um, the, it's really interesting because I tell people, I mean, obviously one of the obvious influences on my writing is uh, Robert Heinlein. Uh, anyone who's read Old Man's War recognizes that it's starship troopers with old people, right? Uh, and I make no bones about it. I put the acknowledgement of Heinlein's influence in the uh, end of the thing. But the thing that I tell people is that so much of my writing influences don't come uh, from science fiction, but in fact come from other places. Um, like, for example, I love crime writing uh, and, you know, crime fiction and uh, stuff like that. So, um, uh, Gregory MacDonald, who wrote the Fletch novels, uh, the, you know, Elmer Leonard, Carl Hyassen, all of them are instrumental in helping me develop my voice. Uh, I was a film critic for a number of years, um, and I, so uh, I learned a lot of story craft from watching dialogue and how people tell stories in, the, in a film sense. So um, classic writers like Ben Hecht, uh, more contemporary writers like uh, Elaine May and William Goldman. Uh, I was a uh, journalist and an opinion columnist. So people like Molly Ivins and Mike Royko and Dave Barry and H.L. Mencken to go back. Uh, the whole Algonquin Roundtable, particularly H.L. Parker, uh, Thurber, and um, 
uh, are people who are uh, really instrumental. The voices that you learn from can come from anywhere, and I would be a poor science fiction and fantasy writer uh, if I only pulled from science fiction and fantasy. So those are the people that uh, I would list as primary influences. Next question. Personally enjoy as narrators for your audiobooks. I like all of my narrators, which uh, is both the truthful answer and the politic answer. <laughs> Um, because the one thing I don't want to be is like, well, I like all of them except for Will Wheaton. <laughs> what the hell, Will? Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that I find really interesting is, of course, all the, all the uh, people that read the books read them differently, more or less, than the way that I heard them in, the he in my head. And the first time that I really heard that, when I heard William DeFree, uh, who narrated Old Man's War, the very first time I heard him narrate, uh, and it was the first book of mine that had an audiobook release, I was like, what the hell? This is not, this is, he, this is not my intent, he's destroying my vision. Um, because I was so used to hearing my own voice, and it took me a little while to get used to the fact that he wasn't me, and that the voice of John Perry through William DeFree is a different voice than the voice I heard. And it wasn't fair to uh, William DeFree as the narrator that I, as the writer, was just so possessive about it. Um, and so I went back to it and after some time had passed and I actually really enjoyed it because it was, again, the thing of the book is only half of what uh, I write, the rest of it is what someone else brings to it. In this case, it was what William DeFree br brought to it. So William DeFree, uh, reading the Old Man's War series, Tavia Gilbert, who read uh, Zoe's Tale and has also done other parts of the Old Man's War series. Um, Zachary Quinto, who did the Dispatcher series. And of course, obviously, Will Wheaton, uh, who in addition to being a really good friend of mine, uh, also is um, only a couple years younger than I am, grew up in the same area as I did, has the same vocal patterns and intonations that I do. And if you ever listen to the two of us speak at the same time, it's ridiculous. Uh, how much we sound alike. Um, so having Will read my books is as close as you're going to get to me reading my books, but better because he is an actual actor, right? <laughs> and he can actually do that, and I'm a mushy mouth writer. Um, so as far as it goes, I really, I, there isn't anybody who has read anything uh, professionally so far that I haven't really uh, enjoyed. So next question. Any plans for a sequel to the Android's Dream? Uh, any plans for a sequel to Android's Dream? I tried to write one once, um, and it's a funny story. So I got a contract for the sequel to the Android's Dream, and I started writing it, and I got like about seven chapters in, and I realized, and this isn't really a spoiler because now the book is like 12 years old, um, that at the end of the book, um, my protagonist's problems were solved because his girlfriend was the richest woman in the universe, and his uh, best friend was a planet-spanning intellig uh, artificial intelligence. And there's very few th situations that money or an AI running an entire planet won't get you out of. <laughs> and so I was writing this story, and it really was literally him being in situations where he couldn't make a phone call. Um, <laughs> and so, and it was readable, and it was fine, but it wasn't good. And so I said to my editor, I was like, I'm gonna stop writing this book because it isn't good and I'm gonna give you another Old Man's War book instead. Is that fine? He was like, yes. <laughs> um, so I would like to come back to the universe. I don't know that I will necessarily come back to the same character because again, the character's problems are solved, uh, but it would be nice to be able to visit that universe again. If I do, uh, uh, then obviously you, you will know about it. In the meantime, the very first chapter of that book um, is a short story that's out there called Judge Sin Goes Golfing, uh, which is kind of a standalone chapter, and it's available through uh, most of the retailers. So you can read that, and that will be, you know, hopefully will be enough until I get back to it. Next question over here. Will you continue to explore issues of disability for paralyzed survivors of Hayden Syndrome who may not have the same financial resources as Chris? Um, the answer to that is, he's talking about the lock-in books where um, the protagonist, uh, Chris, uh, in addition to having Hayden syndrome, which locks them in their body, uh, and they have to get around through the use of a, um, basically an android body, they're driving it around. Uh, but Chris is also um, very, very 
very wealthy, like one tenth of one tenth of one percent wealthy. Um, so all their, a lot of their problems are solved. And in fact, uh, one of the things that really is going to be interesting is to talk about what the changes in that world mean for the people who don't have means, because of course, uh, everybody um, who uh, everybody who has the one tenth of one percent uh, lifestyle is playing a much easier game than everybody else, and it doesn't matter uh, even when you factor in other aspects of it. So yes, I would say that there's going to be some approach to it. I don't know that it's going to be an entire book because the series of books that take place in the universe where Hayden Syndrome happens are murder mysteries, and there has to be a murder. It has to go on. Uh, going uh, in that direction, but certainly in developing the world you do have to look at the issues of inequality, particularly here in America where we, we're kind of addicted to inequality. We seem to think it's our gig. So, next question. Uh, what is the, your favorite universe that you've ever created? <sighs> <laughs> um, it's hard to answer because one, I don't really think about it that way, you know. Um, Part of it is also that, uh, quite frankly, the favorite universe is the universe that I'm writing in at the moment because it's the one that I'm immersed in the most. Um, I'm really into the interdependency universe right now because I'm writing that book. Um, and when I write the Hayden's universe, I'm really super interested in that because it's close to contemporary time and I have to factor in the real world with that in a way that I don't have to with everything else. And when I'm writing the Old Man's War universe, uh, I'm super invested in that because it's my best known universe and that's the one that people will murder me for if I don't do things the way they want them to do it. Um, so, you know, quite frankly, a lot of it is, is situational, you know, and I don't want to say it's like which child do you like the best because everybody knows everybody has a favorite child. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but it is one of those things that whatever I'm spending the most time in at that particular time is, is the one. I like to think that my, all my universes are complex enough that um, there's lots to go on no matter what. But, um, but yeah, it's usually the one I'm most interested in at that particular time because I'm writing it. So question here. Uh, you mentioned you were a journalist and a film critic, I think. Uh, How did you make the transition from that to being a full-time writer? I mean, I was a full-time writer when I was a journalist and film critic, so, um, I mean, uh, when you have an editor going, you've got a deadline in 45 minutes, where's that article? And then you have a copy editor who's strangling you because you are really bad with commas. Um, they, literally, no, this really happened. The Kim, the copy editor, I did something, and I don't know what it was, but she, like, marched down to where I was, and she went, and I was like, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did. And I still don't, so she would probably still strangle me. So um, the transition happened um, actually not because I was a journalist, but because I worked at America Online. And America Online booted my ass out. Um, and it wasn't because uh, America Online disliked me or I was a terrible employee. Um, it just had a tendency to dissolve um, you know, divisions and uh, you know, little departments and stuff like that. And I was a company-wide resource uh, as the in-house writer and editor, and nobody wanted to put me on their individual, um, you know, uh, department uh, payload because everybody used me. Um, and so uh, they, when my department then dissolved, I was the only one that was not transferred somewhere else. I was laid off, and I was like, well, I guess I got to be writing full time now. Um, the good news is that AOL came back almost immediately because nobody was getting any writing done. And as a contractor, they they paid me twice as much for half as much work. So well done. Capitalism. <laughs> so that's how I made that transition. So last uh, question here. Uh, which of your characters do you most identify with? Um, people want me to say that it's John Perry, uh, who is the protagonist uh, of the first uh, arc of the Old Man's War series. Um, and I see why they say that, because he has my first name, he is a writer, and he lives in my house. Like, literally, when Old Man's Wars starts off, he's living in my house, and he talks about the cemetery, Harris Creek Cemetery, which is literally down the road. He lives in my house because I was lazy, and I'm like, I'm only going to be on the planet Earth for a chapter and a half. He's living at my house. Why the hell not? Um, so they assume that that's the uh, character I identify with the most, but he's not. Uh, John Perry is not me. He's much 
nicer than I am. Um, the person in my worlds that I identify with the most is um, Harry Wilson, who becomes who is a side character in the first four books, uh, and then becomes a primary character in books five and six. Um, so if you read him, he is the closest to all the characters to me. Jane Sagan is based on my wife, Christine, uh, who is just this Amazonian badass who is awesome. Um, although her favorite character of all of mine is Kiva, and Kiva is uh, from the Interdependency series. And a lot of people like Kiva, and I've been told that if anything bad happens to Kiva, um, they will burn my house down, so. But that won't dissuade me, people. I gotta let you know, things, things are gonna get real in this last book. Uh, question here, and then we, we need to cut off the lines, so I'm gonna get these last three questions as quickly as possible, go. When your stories were adapted for Love, Death, and Robots, did you have creative input on that? Uh, so three short stories I wrote, um, th uh, three robots, When the Yogurt Took Over, and Alternate Histories are and part of the um, Netflix series Love, Death, and Robots, which is an animated, uh, adult animation series. Um, and the answer to that is Tim Miller, who is the, uh, one of the producers, um, was really good at um, like letting me know what was going on. He sent me scripts, he asked for my input, all that sort of stuff. I wouldn't say I had any sort of creative control because they were doing what they were gonna do, but they did listen to me. Uh, they made some changes that I suggested, other changes they didn't. Um, and, but by and large, uh, they were very congenial to work with. Um, I'm very excited to see what they do with the second season. Question here. What, what prompted you to write Fuzzy Nation like so far into your, your fame? It wasn't an early work since it leaned so heavily on Little Fuzzy. I'm just curious like why, what, what prompted you to write it after you had already made your name? What prompted me to write Little uh, Fuzzy Nation after I wrote, uh, after I'd written so many books? Because I was pissed off at Tor. Um, and this is, this is the actual truth. I had had a uh, bad negotiation with them and it ended poorly and then I was out of contract uh, and I didn't write for them for another three years. Um, and everything's fine now. They gave me lots of money. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I had this, I had all suddenly had a whole lot of free time and I'd always had this sort of curiosity of what would it be like to take a golden era, golden age, of science fiction book and update it because the golden era of science fiction, like again, people write in their contemporary time and so they are very dated. Um, and so just for my own fun, like I wasn't planning to sell it, wasn't planning to do anything with it. I wrote it just to see what it'd be like to take that story and Fuzzy Nation I was able to use because, uh, or Little Fuzzy I was able to use because it was in the public domain. Um, so there were no rights issues. Um, and so I just wrote it for fun to see what it was like. And it was actually really great. It was cathartic and I got to write something and it was fun. I was like, oh, now I know. And then my, my agent called and was like, what are you doing? Because if I don't write for him, then he doesn't make money from me. And I told him, I've just written this thing that you will not be able to sell. And he's like, challenge accepted. <laughs> um, and so I sent it to him and he was able to sell it. And we got the sign off of the Piper Estate and so on and so forth. But that's why I did it, because at the time I was like, I have lots of free time, so I might as well um, do this. I think it's really good for writers, maybe not in that circumstance, but um, to do, but in general, to do things just for them every once in a while because it connects you with the things that you want to do. Very last question, we have to do this very quickly. Okay. Do you look at the cutting edge of technology and research what's going on, like at the very highest, what's coming to get your ideas of wild things to take off with? Not necessarily. I will read it because I just like reading about it, um, and then my brain will start thinking about stuff. But um, most of this technology that I am writing about is not really that cutting edge. It's just extrapolations of stuff that already exists now. Um, you know, that said, you know, people are like, oh, you know, people are doing direct brain implants now. That's that's something you predicted. You're you're a wizard, and I'll be like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> Um, and in fact, I absolutely deserve no credit for any of that. You know, lots of people have uh, figured out the same things that I, that I have figured out. Uh, and besides which, science fiction writers are really, really bad at being futurists. Don't believe that we know what's going on. Because if we knew what was going on, we would be playing the stock market, not writing science fiction. So. And that is the end. Thank you so much, everybody.